This is like extra awesome. Can I get a Hoya? Hoya. Oh, yeah. The Ford Mustang has continuously been in production since 1964 and a half. And in the Mustang's 57 goddamn years of straight production, Ford has delivered six generations of Mustang with tons of mid-cycle refreshes and hundreds of performance variant trims. But which one should you buy? Which generation presents the most bang for your buck? Which one shows the best performance traits, reliability, ease of modification, street cred, and or nostalgia? Or maybe, more importantly, which one has the best combination of those things? Well, lace up them shoes, boy, and step away from the car because today we're gonna be talking about which generation of the crowd killer is the best generation for your money. But before we jump right in, we gotta hit you with the plug. If you're enjoying the content, subscribe. Our team works very hard to bring you daily content. Give the video a thumbs up. It helps us get in front of more car enthusiasts just like yourself. And if you ever need anything wheel, tire, or suspension related, come see your boy over at FitmentIndustries.com. We have over a million different wheel and tire packages, plus accessories and merch. You don't even have to wait for your delayed tax return. You can build now and pay with your tax return later with as low as 0% financing from a firm. These guys are seriously rock stars. And if you like oddball cars and want to see some behind the scenes action here at Fitment Industries, give me a follow on the old IG at SeanB.FI. Let's get started. The very first generation Mustang spanned from 1965 through 1973 with four major updates throughout. First, there's the 1965 to 1966 Mustang. The coupe is your typical classic Mustang shape and is the car that became the world's most successful vehicle launch in history with over 100,000 units sold in the first three months and over 400,000 units in the first year. It's a record that has yet to be broken. The 1965 and 66 Mustang also came with a two plus two fastback with a 289 cubic inch engine ranging from 200 horsepower through the top trim hypo K-code cars with a 270 horsepower 289 engine. And this is also where Shelby came on board with Ford to take the 65 and 66 Fastback to the racetrack with the GT350 model, sporting that K-Code engine with a power bump up to 306 horsepower and a ton of racier bits sprinkled throughout. For 1967, the Mustang would see its first facelift. The coupe and convertibles had more aggressive styling with a further recessed grille and taillight panel. But the Fastback got a pretty large update with a roof that sloped all the way to the rear of the car versus the previous Fastback that ended near the middle of the quarter panel. This would be the model that claimed its fame with the hit 1968 film Bullet. The same engine options were available for 67, but an additional 390 cubic inch engine, good for 320 horsepower in the Fastback would be optional. And then there's an additional engine for 1968 with a new 210 horsepower, 302 cubic inch V8 designed with federal emissions regulations in mind. The GT350 stuck around for this facelift and still used that 289 cubic inch engine from before, but then the guys over at Shelby went absolutely and dumped a 7 liter 355 horsepower 420 torque police interceptor engine into the fastback and called it the GT500 and these things murdered their competition in straight lines. Another facelift came by 1969, but this time it was pretty major for all convertibles coupes and fastbacks were renamed to sport roof coupes. The car got wider, the car got longer, and it also got heavier. The new styling was super aggressive and it's one of my personal favorites as far as classic Mustangs go. This was really the time Ford started pushing their special variants and decorative options. This is where you start to see scoops all over the place and tons of performance trim levels available. From the GT, which was dropped after 69, the Mach 1, the Boss 302, the Boss 429, the GT350 and the GT500. Essentially what this did was allow Ford to homologate some of their engines in an attempt to be more competitive in the Trans Am series, SCCA and other racing series. Another small update was brought in for 1970 to tame the aggressiveness to appeal to some more buyers. By 1971, Ford recognized the growing demand for larger, more luxury oriented cars. And thus Ford gave us the big fat lazy 71 to 73 Mustang that was still for some reason considered part of the first generation. This thing weighed 800 pounds more than the previous facelift. And the restyling also sought to create the illusion that the cars were even larger when they were physically more larger. With more emissions restrictions came less power on top of that increased weight. Mustang was no longer part of this go fast business that they had at the time and consumers would turn to smaller, more efficient Pintos and Mavericks with gas prices and emission restrictions on the rise. Taking notes on that in 1973 for the 1974 model year, the second generation Mustang or Mustang II would be based on the much lighter Pinto platform. And although it's prone to making people puke in their mouths on the spot, the oil crisis that followed two months after release made the Mustang II a genuinely great option at the time and was very competitive against the newly popular import coupes to the likes of the 240Z, the Toyota 
Celica and other similar cars. That first year, a V8 wasn't even an option. You had a choice of a 2.3 liter four cylinder or a 2.8 liter V6. The 302 would be brought back for 75 and then wouldn't be marketed as the 5.0 until the king of the second generation Mustangs performance variant, the King Cobra with a whopping 130 horsepower. Mixing in the middle of this hot mess would be a luxury Ghia trim after Ford acquired the Italian coach building firm Carrozzeria Ghia Spa, a Mach 1 graphics package and the infamous Cobra 2. Fun fact, my first car was actually a 1978 Cobra 2. It was white with the blue stripes and had a really weird 2.8 liter V6 and that hot. Anyway, I think we all know the Mustang 2 isn't going to make the cut, so let's just move on and try to delete this image out of our heads. In 1979, we would see the introduction of the third generation Mustang based on Ford's Fox platform. The GT nameplate was back as well as the Cobra and a bunch of other random letters like L, GL, GLX, and LX, along with other special editions, namely the GT350 20th anniversary, SVO, Cobra R, and Turbo GT. Anyway, the earlier Fox Mustangs aren't too far off the awkwardness that was the second generation Mustang 2. But come 1983, the Mustang would start moving back towards its roots of performance and reintroduce the convertible after a nine year absence. 1983 also introduced the Turbo GT, which got a 2.3 liter turbocharged four cylinder and was very well on par performance wise with the V8 GTs. 84 gave us the GT350 20th anniversary, which would later turn into a lawsuit for copyright infringement from Carroll Shelby after the relationship between Ford and Shelby fell through many years earlier. 84 also gave us the GT V8 beating SVO Mustang, which used a more powerful version of that GT 2.3 liter turbo engine. By 86, the Mustang would get a smoothed out grill and fuel injection, but by 1980, the Mustang would receive a major facelift, ending the 4i front fascia and moving to the aero era of the Fox Body Mustang. 1987 to 1993 remained relatively unchanged outside of special models and dropping the T-top option after 87. Fun note, that means there's only one year of a T-top option for a non-4i Mustang, which is pretty rare and pretty cool. This is where the 5.0 nameplate really kinda got cemented into history. These things were everywhere and they sold tons of them. They were easy to work on, easy to modify. They sounded amazing and they presented a lot of value for the money. 1993 would be the last year of the third generation Mustang and it went out with a bang with the first SVT engineered a Mustang, the SVT Cobra and the SVT Cobra R. Getting a full refresh for the fourth generation dubbed SN95, the Mustang would still remain on a modified version of the Fox platform from 94 all the way to 2004. For the first two years, 94 and 95, the Mustang would still utilize the pushrod 5 liter engine in both its GT models and SVT Cobra variant. But in 96, the Mustang went full modular, downsizing to a two valve overhead cam 4.6 liter engine. Power remained pretty well the same as the 5 liter, but with a little bit less displacement. The SVT Cobra, on the other hand, got a four valve dual overhead cam engine with 305 horsepower, quite a lot from a Mustang from 1996, but they almost needed something like this to compete with the upcoming LS1 Camaro and Trans Am, and this was the answer. This pretty much remained the same until the mid-cycle refresh of 1999, designating the SN95 New Edge, which got a bump in power with a revised cylinder head and much more angular design based kind of on that same shape. Power was up to 260 and the Cobra got a supposed bump to 320. I say supposed because there was actually a class action lawsuit put up against Ford for pumping up the numbers, as you would say. The classic case of overselling and under delivering. The 99 Cobras were making less than the claimed horsepower and the people were infuriated. Thus why there's no SVT Cobra for the 2000 model year outside of the insane 5.4 liter Cobra R with that big giant infamous spoiler. Anyway, Cobra wouldn't be back until 2001 and then out again for 2002. Much like previous generations, the trim levels here were quite excessive. You could get a bullet recreation, a Mach 1 with a four valve engine, 35th anniversary additions, 40th anniversary additions, 100th anniversary Ford Centennial additions, it's too friggin' many. But in 2003, everything changed. SVT took the four valve engine, gave it a much stronger iron block and filled it with a fully forged rotating assembly and slapped on a big old blower. These cars were super aggressive looking and put out a solid 390 horsepower and would take extremely well to modification. This was also the first time that we've seen an independent rear suspension on a Mustang. These cars were beating up on tons of cars that were much more expensive than it 
dubbing the 0304 Cobras as the Terminator. Moving on to the fifth generation, this new chassis was exclusive to the Mustang and would put retro futuristic styling on the map and would lead the way for many other nameplate comebacks for years to come. The 2005 Mustang GT was the resurrection of Mustang's past with a design almost solely based on the 65 and 66 Mustang Fastback. A new engine also came into play with the three valve 4.6 liter producing 300 horsepower. It wouldn't be until 2007 that Ford would purchase the rights to market the Mustang with a Shelby variant with the Shelby GT500. The GT500 received a 5.4 liter supercharged engine that would pump out 500 horsepower, which has nothing to do with the GT500 name, but it was a game changer at the time. Outside of a few additional boring trims, the Mustang would remain relatively the same until it got a mid-cycle refresh in 2010. But don't be fooled, the 2010 facelift GT still has the old three-valve engine. It wouldn't be until 2011 that the new 5-liter Coyote would come into play and change the game forever. This pretty well sparked the modern rendition of the horsepower war. And by the time the fifth generation ended in 2014, the Mustang would be making 412 horsepower with the GT500 pushing out 660 horsepower and would bring back the Boss 302 as the circuit track oriented model. The sixth and current generation of Mustang is when things really started taking a turn for the better. 2015 marked another completely new Mustang platform and the first Mustang to come standard with independent rear suspension across the board. Utilizing an even more powerful, higher revving 5 liter engine and a 300 horsepower turbocharged 4 cylinder engine and an actually decent interior, these cars were an instant hit and are capable of some pretty impressive numbers both on and off the track. 2016 showed us the first big performance variant of this new Mustang and it brings back the GT350 nameplate not seen since the 1984 Shelby lawsuit. And it was a freaking game changer. Ford developed a flat plane crank 5.2 liter V8 that revved to 8200 RPM and they slipped some $40,000 carbon fiber wheels on that bad boy. That's freaking insane race car shit, guys. But that crazy didn't stop there. And then 2018 delivered us a mid-cycle refresh with a more aggressive fascia and a new 10-speed automatic transmission that's actually really, really good and really, really fast. Then along came the 2020 GT500 with 750 horsepower. The sixth generation Mustang took the Mustang brand to the 21st century and beyond by taking the affordable pony car that lived on the reputation of being just good enough and turned it into a great car with great performance at an affordable price and delivered us some performance variants that completely dominated the segment with out of this world engineering. And so although I hate to be the guy that says the best Mustang, is the newest Mustang, it's without a doubt the truest statement I've ever heard. Ford really stepped up the game with interior quality for 2015, mixed with its performance capabilities, reliability, and ease of making big power. It's a pretty clear winner. The sixth generation Mustang is the best Mustang of all freaking time. But that about wraps it up for this special crowd killer episode of What Generation Is Best series. We will be making more videos just like this one. So please leave a comment and let us know what kind of cars you guys want to see us cover next. Make sure you guys are subscribed to get any notifications to stay in the loop with all the crazy stuff that we're doing over here. And of course, don't forget to head over to fitmanindustries.com for any and all of your wheel, tire, and suspension needs. We'll get you hooked up with the exact setup that you're looking for. I'm Sean, SeanB.fi on Instagram. Thank you so much for watching. Please don't hate me. Peace. F*** you. What if you would have shot me in the face?